pleasure now to uh, introduce the next, next uh, speaker, is uh, Dr. Benedetto Vitiello. He's the head of the Child and Adolescent Unit of the National Institute of Mental Health US, and uh, he's going to present uh, communication on toward developing more effective treatment and preventive interventions in youth mental health research perspective. Please, Dr. Vitiello. Thank you, and um, thank you to the organizer of this meeting in particular, to uh, Giovanni De Girolamo. Uh, I lear I'm learning a lot. I think it's a, it's a unique and a wonderful uh, conference uh, so far. Um, so we're going to talk about um, uh, the approach that uh, uh, our institute, the National Institute of Mental Health, is taking um, uh, toward uh, developing new interventions uh, also for um, adolescents, also for young adults, um, but across the board. So it's not really specific to this. And uh, uh, just to, um, uh, to frame this, you know, I, I work in a branch that deals with testing the effectiveness of interventions in mental health. Uh, so what we do basically is to um, uh, uh, generate that knowledge on which you can then build evidence-based uh, practice. Uh, we don't deal with dissemination and implementation because another branch, which is called the services branch, does that. But what we do is we conduct experiments uh, which are clinical trials, basically, in order to have good evidence that uh, treatments uh, have certain effects and are reasonably safe. And I have to say that if we focused on youth, as it was defined yesterday, between age 14, 15, and 24, 25, uh, we have very little research that has specifically focused on that age range. Uh, there are exceptions, like prevention of eating disorders that actually had that window, and also uh, psych early psychosis. But by and large, all the research really is conducted in, in group of patients age 18 and older, or age 18 and younger. And that is due uh, to different reasons, uh, some of which are ethical. All the ethics rules, for instance, um, are separate for minors which are under age 18, uh, that they need uh, consent and permission by the parents. And so uh, the tradition of clinical trials in some way split uh, uh, the, the testing of intervention of youth uh, around age 18. And I think that is a limitation that we need to acknowledge um, from the very beginning. Um, I have to say that uh, a lot of progress has been done uh, to test intervention in uh, adolescents up to age 18, uh, which is an area that up to 10 years ago was very much neglected. And we were applying uh, medications and psychotherapies to um, adolescents, uh, meaning age uh, 12 to 18, based on information from adults. And that was uh, recognized to be a, a wrong uh, limitation from a scientific point of view due to the developing brain that uh, moderates the effect of this intervention. And therefore, a program, a systematic program, was launched about 15, 20 years ago that has brought a lot of information. Uh, and right now, we have a number of treatments uh, that uh, have a proven efficacy, so they're evidence-based um, uh, medicine in some way. Um, so um, if we compare, for instance, just to get a, a sense of how we're doing, uh, all the clinical trials that are in clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, a, a database in the United States that now is mandatory, meaning everyone launching a clinical trial must register in this uh, uh, database. And we look at all the trials around this period of time, it cannot be done uh, previously because clinical trial was not mandatory at that point. We see that a trial in mental health compares fairly well with uh, clinical trials in cardiology in terms of numbers. And also, if we look at the percentage that are conducted in youth, youth usually means age 18 or below, 
uh, it, it's not bad compared to cardiology. You can argue that mental health is more important for uh, youth that uh, can be cardiology, and so that's a very good point in some way. But what I'm saying is that the numbers are, are pretty good. Um, where is less good is that most of these trials are, are small. They have a sample size that is 100 or below, and that creates problems because these trials don't really have a lot of power to be informative, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of trials uh, don't distinguish between the different alternative treatments and therefore are not uh, interpretable. But r with this limitation, we have a number of interventions that can be tested and proven to cap some value, uh, especially cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety disorder, depression, obsessing compulsive disorder, and eating disorder are evidence-based, uh, based on clinical trials. Uh, interpersonal therapy in depression and behavioral therapy for conduct disorder and autism and attention deficit disorder. And in parallel, we have a series of psychotropic medications, uh, stimulants, which is amphetamine products and methylphenidate, antidepressant of the serotonergic family, antipsychotics and mood stabilizers that have now evidence of beating placebo uh, in, uh, in these conditions in, uh, in adolescents. Uh, also, we have conducted some studies uh, that actually compare directly different medications, sort of comparative effectiveness, like this trial that was published a couple of years ago, uh, comparing in uh, bipolar disorder, uh, Depakote, uh, lithium, and risperidone, and showing that risperidone is much more potent, at least on the short term, in controlling the symptoms of mania, not in recurrence, but in controlling the acute uh, uh, symptoms. Or for anxiety disorder, uh, including social phobia and generalized anxiety disorder, these clinical trials in about 500 uh, children and adolescents, primarily adolescents, um, uh, shown that uh, compared with the placebo, both the medication alone or cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure, basically in response prevention, are very effective compared to a placebo. And if you combine the two of them, you get an extra significant uh, effect. Uh, and the same is for obsessive compulsive disorder, where the symptoms go down uh, both on uh, medication or cognitive behavioral therapy. But if you combine the two, they go down uh, more, uh, more steeply. So all this information is useful, and right now we have some guidelines for the first time based on meta-analysis and series of clinical trials that basically can uh, indicate uh, what kind of treatment we can use for different conditions. Uh, psychotherapy is preferred, if it's possible, pharmacotherapy, and combinations in different types. Um, now, uh, all this uh, has been very fruitful and very useful. However, there is also a sense that uh, we have reached the limit of this methodology. Uh, I mean, we can argue if this is really the right conclusion or right perception or not, but uh, uh, there is a sense that uh, this has been a very uh, expensive and time-consuming uh, investment that has paid off but uh, should it be continued in the same vein, that's not clear. And that's why uh, there is a new approach that is being proposed and launched. And uh, uh, so one of the concerns is that many trials are inconclusive, that they don't really able to uh, have a clear message of, uh, of a clinical statistical significance of one treatment over the other. They come out that everyone is a winner, or everyone is a loser, and you don't know how to interpret the data. Uh, for instance, of a study conducted by industry for antidepressants, uh, more than 50% uh, cannot distinguish active medication from placebo. And there are methodological reasons that we can talk about that, how these trials are conducted. But it's a real problem. Uh, also, the targets we are dealing with, this huge category of attention deficit disorder, depression, anxiety disorder, uh, they not are very heterogeneous. They certainly they have a validity, uh, because the best validity we have right now, we don't have really a replacement for that, but certainly they are not ideal.